Hello everyone and welcome to my living room. I am Sarah White. I am Director of Operations at Historic St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia, and it is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. John Ragasta into my virtual living room to have a little chat. Dr. Ragasta is an historian, a lawyer, an award-winning author. He has taught law and history at the University of Virginia, George Washington University, and at Oberlin, Hamilton, and Randolph Colleges. He is currently a fellow at the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities. Um, I want to point out uh, this book, one of our favorites here at Historic St. John's Church, called uh, Proclaiming a Revolution, Patrick Henry, by Dr. Ragasta, and he is also the lecturer for an online course called The Forgotten Founding Father, Patrick Henry, which I finished last night. It was fascinating. It is free. It is online. Anyone can take it. I would encourage you to do so, and I will post the links on the YouTube page and in the video at the end of our talk today. So welcome, Dr. Ragasta. Thank you, Sarah. I'm glad to be here. Great. Thank you so much. I hope you like the surroundings here. Can I get you anything to drink? <laughs> well, I already I have my mug of tea with me. Okay, good. <laughs> I, I have my water. Good. Um, so uh, what I want to do is talk about the revolution and Patrick Henry. April 19th, 1775, the shot heard around the world. The war starts in Massachusetts. The first skirmishes, the first military skirmishes of the American Revolution start at Lexington and Concord on that day, April 19th. Three weeks, or rather 27 days earlier at historic St. John's Church, Patrick Henry delivers his most famous speech, Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death, uh, and we like to, we talk about how that speech had a, had an effect on what happened later in Massachusetts, given that the Virginia Convention uh, decided to, in fact, form a militia and take up arms, and, and, you know, should need be, uh, take up arms against the British. Um, but what I want to do is talk about actually what happened here on April 19th, 1775. Like, what happened after the speech here in Virginia, what happened April 20th, April 19th or so um, here in Virginia as things were starting to heat up. In right, well, Sarah, thank you. It's, I mean, it's very interesting. I always tell my students that you don't really need to remember particular dates, but you do need to remember the order in which things happen because that's really important. And you've already alluded to one of the most important things. Lexington and Concord, April 19th, 1775. Uh, if you remember the Longfellow, phone, uh, uh, Longfellow poem, you know, on the 18th of April in 75. So, but nobody in Virginia knows about that until the end of April because they don't have a telephone, they don't have the internet. Um, and so how these things occurred in order is critically important. So uh, where I would start, and you could go back as far as you want, but in September and October, 1784, 1774, excuse me, um, First Continental Congress. They're meeting uh, in Philadelphia. Patrick Henry is there. He gives a very famous speech about, I am not a Virginian, I am an American. Um, but they decide in Philadelphia that uh, we're going to boycott British goods. And they tell the colonies, you might want to consider being armed. Well, this creates an escalation. The royal officials are listening to this and they're very concerned. And so when the Fifth Virginia Convention meets in Richmond in March of 1775, the royal authorities, Governor Dunmore is already very concerned. Um, they've received word from Britain that the royal governors should seize ammunition. Britain has banned the importation of gunpowder into the colonies. So it's, everything's being stirred up. And Patrick Henry, of course, makes his famous speech. The only thing people remember from that speech is seven words at the end, give me liberty, give me death. 
very important words. But we remember, and you certainly remember at St. John's, how prescient Henry is. I mean, he's talking about, we're going to have a war. Now, this is before the war starts. And he says, we're going to have a war. Uh, what means this martial array? Why are we have red coats in Britain? Why do we have warships? And then remarkably, uh, he's telling people, the war has actually begun. Now, this is March 23rd. The war has actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? This is three weeks before Lexington and Concord, but he's already heard the gunfire at Lexington and Concord. So, um, after he gives this speech, and before Lexington and Concord is known in Virginia, Governor Dunmore, the governor, the royal governor, realizes we have a real problem. Patrick Henry has convinced Virginia they need to arm against royal authority. And so the governor decides he's going to do exactly what General Gage is going to do in Lexington and Concord. He said, we're going to seize the gunpowder in Williamsburg. And so that's really the first thing that happens is after Patrick Henry gives this speech, uh, the royal governor on uh, the evening of April 20th into the April 21st seizes 15 barrels. Now that's two days after Lexington and Concord, but nobody knew about Lexington and Concord, seizes the gunpowder in Williamsburg. So that, that, and you know, that's all coming out of Henry's speech. And so, um, so what happened? The governor took the gunpowder, he took it out onto a ship in the harbor. Yes, there's uh, His Majesty's ship Magdalene uh, is in the, in the James River and they uh, seize the gunpowder and they take it out. Well, what happens, uh, we almost have a Lexington and Concord in Virginia. And uh, the people of Williamsburg find out that the gunpowder is being seized, right. which is exactly what's going to happen in Concord. And they show up on the palace green with their guns and with weapons and they march on the governor's palace. Well, the cooler heads prevail, I suppose you can say cooler heads. Uh, Peyton Randolph and other uh, local officials say, you know, just wait, we'll take care of this. And people disperse. Well, then you have this wonderful kabuki dance where the governor and the local officials are lying to each other and they all know that the other one's lying, but they, they're gonna do it anyway. So the town officials write to the governor and the royal governor Dunmore and say, you took our powder. Uh, we need that gunpowder just in case there's a slave insurrection. You know, we're not going to use that on redcoats. We're worried about a slave insurrection. Um, and of course, planters were worried about slave insurrections all the time. But this is completely BS. Well, the governor gets this letter and he writes back in a similar phone. He says, oh, well, I heard there was a slave insurrection in the next county. So I was just seizing the gunpowder to keep it safe. And again, all, all BS, and everybody knew the other one was lying, but we don't get Lexington and Concord in Williamsburg. Um, and the governor, when the people gather a second time wanting the gunpowder back, the governor actually issues the warning, which he's going to act on in another six months, and says, if you attack royal officials, I will free the slaves and arm them against the people. Well, if there's one thing that Britain wanted to do, really convince all Southern white men that they need to support the American Revolution, it was tell them that we're gonna free the enslaved people. So um, this is all going on. You calm down things in Williamsburg, but in Fredericksburg, 700 people, 700 militiamen basically gather, again, armed, prepared to march on Williamsburg to get the gunpowder back. And they receive word from Peyton Randolph and reportedly George Washington is president and said, you know, um, let's just calm down. We're talking with the governor, we'll take care of these things. And that meeting occurs on, um, I believe it's April 20th, uh, April 20th to the 24th. They're actually there for a few days. Um, no, I'm sorry, it's April 24th, excuse me. Um, and so they don't, they don't march on Williamsburg, but they haven't heard about Lexington and Concord yet. Lexington and Concord, April 19th, Fredericksburg, April 24th. The word hasn't arrived yet in Virginia. Well, Lexington and Concord is published in Virginia on April 29th. Word must have arrived on the 28th. Uh, it's published on the 29th. And Patrick Henry 
has called a meeting in Hanover County for May 2nd about what are we going to do about this gunpowder. And so when he meets on May 2nd with the militiamen in Hanover County, initially about 150 men armed, many of them on horseback, arrive and Patrick Henry says, you know, we need to do something about this gunpowder. We know what's happening in Lexington and Concord. We know the Redcoats attacked the farmers who were out in their fields trying to, trying to prepare for spring planting. Uh, we know that war is inevitable. We need to get our gunpowder back. And Patrick Henry starts to march on Williamsburg. Uh, he begins with 150 men. It's about 60 miles to Williamsburg. Uh, by the time he gets to Don Castle Ordinary, about 15 miles from Williamsburg, some sources say there are thousands of men who have now gathered with Patrick Henry. And all through that time, the royal governor is issuing threats. He's issuing warnings. Patrick Henry's a rebel. Uh, you should disperse. Uh, and Patrick Henry just keeps coming. He, he knows the war is coming. And... Um, they get to Don Castle Ordinary, and finally the governor basically sends a check to pay for the gunpowder, uh, which was his way, everybody saves face. I'm not gonna give up the gunpowder, but since I seized the gunpowder of the colonists, here's money to pay for it. And Patrick Henry takes that money and turns it over to the Continental Congress to buy arms for the American Revolution. So, you know, the, these things all occur in sequence. Um, I think the important thing, and I'm happy to answer questions or talk about this, is, you know, Patrick Henry here, um, the American people, they were proud to be British. They loved the king at this time. They've been brought up loving the king. They were, they were devoted citizens and subjects of Britain. And the country is on a precipice, on a cliff, and it's dark. And Patrick Henry on March 23rd is yelling, jump, give me liberty, give me death. You need to jump. Uh, and he's telling people in, who are afraid, uh, who are being told to challenge the King of England, we need to jump. And then on May 2nd, he says, I'll jump first. And Henry leads things forward. He says, no, I'm going to attack the royal governor if that's what it takes. And it's after this May 2nd incident that uh, Patrick Henry is declared a rebel. And when uh, Britain is trying to make peace, uh, at one point they issue an edict that uh, comes from London and says, we will um, excuse all of the rebellion. Uh, we will not penalize anybody except for 20 individuals, George Washington, John Hancock, John Adams, Patrick Henry is on the list because he's the one that really leads uh, Virginia into this rebellion. And so why George Washington in particular? Because he had been at the Second Virginia Convention? Because well, he agreed to be in the militia? Right. It's, it's a good question. Let's continue the progression. So um, March 23rd, Patrick Henry, give me liberty or give me death. April 19th, uh, Lexington and Concord. April 21st, we seize the gunpowder in Virginia. Patrick Henry marches on Richmond on May uh, 2nd. The Second Continental Congress starts to meet in Philadelphia at about that same time. And George Washington goes to the Second Continental Congress. And in June, he's made the general for the Continental Army. Army. We, we create a Continental Army. So, so George Washington. And of course, that's a funny incident as well. You know, again, you know, there's, there's a lot of posturing that goes around. Uh, George Washington is at the Second Continental Congress. Everybody knows that they're going to have to appoint a military leader. And George Washington is saying, you know, oh, not me, not me. I'm, I'm not up to this. But the whole time he's marching around in his uniform, he's wearing his uniform and his sword at the Second Continental Congress saying, well, you know, don't send me as general to the Continental Army. Uh, and of course, he is, he is appointed general of the Continental Army. So, um, but, you know, Britain is saying, look, there's, there's some of these people who we aren't going to forgive because they really led the rebellion. And Patrick Henry is among the list. Um, you know, it's telling that Thomas Jefferson, who does not like Patrick Henry by the end of the war, uh, but Thomas Jefferson admits that Patrick Henry got the ball of revolution rolling. It was Patrick Henry that, that you know, took people. Edmund Randolph talks about, you know, Americans are afraid. We don't know what to do. Things are, are unclear. And it's Patrick Henry that tells us 
on March 23rd at St. John's Church in Richmond that no, we have no choice. We need to go to war and we will win that war. So if the king was willing to um, forgive and forget except for those 20 people, um, like when was that? When, when was the point of no return? If there was um, one. Uh, he was willing to well, forgive, no, and then that, that happened, and he said, forget it. Right. I mean, th that's a question historians grapple with. When when does it come, become, you know, it's beyond things. Uh, I tend to agree, people, it's exactly where you started out. April 19th, once you have redcoats spilling blood in Lexington and, Car and spilling a lot of blood, a lot of their blood, but, but also a lot of um, citizens' blood. Um, and I think to some extent, you see that in what's happening in Virginia. Those people meeting in Fredericksburg, 700 militiamen meet, and they're told that the royal governor has taken the gunpowder. Um, but Peyton Randolph says, look, we're going to take care of it. Let's all calm down. And everybody goes home. A few days later, when they're meeting in Hanover, and they now know about Lexington and Concord, nobody goes home. People say, no, we, we know what's going to happen if we go home. We have to fight. And so I think Lexington and Concord really becomes the point, and the British don't necessarily realize that immediately, um, right. that you've really messed it up. But, you know, the British are making peace offers um, really throughout the revolution. They just never are willing to offer what would have solved the problem. Gotcha. Okay. So um, when, wh when and where was the first bloodshed in Virginia. In Virginia. It's actually many months later. Um, now there, there's, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, fighting back and forth, but it's really ruffians and so on. Um, the Battle of Great Bridge is really the first significant uh, action in Virginia in the revolution, and it's not until early December of 1775. And the Battle of Great Bridge is actually fascinating. Um, by that point, Dunmore, uh, shortly after this period, he, he flees with his family to the British warships because he realizes he's not safe in Williamsburg. And again, in this kabuki dance, Peyton Randolph and everybody keeps saying, well, of course you're safe in Williamsburg. Um, he flees to these ships. By October, uh, and then, then into November, he issues these decrees saying the people are in rebellion and I therefore, am going to free the enslaved people owned by patriots. In other words, if you were a loyalist and you had slaves, they were still your slaves. But if you're Patrick Henry or George Washington, he says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna free your slaves. And he starts to gather forces in Norfolk. He's got some uh, Royal Marines, he's got a few redcoats, and he also has a number of these formerly enslaved people. He refers to them as the Ethiopian Regiment. And they're forming in Norfolk and again, nobody really knows what's going to happen at this point. We know what happens, but, but they don't know what's going to happen. And how many people in Virginia are going to be loyalists? Now, we know, in fact, that Virginia has relatively few loyalists compared to most of the other colonies. And we could talk about why that is. But um, the governor is still trying to rally people to the king's banner. He's meeting in Norfolk with these troops. And you have um, Minutemen Company marching from Culpeper, Virginia. Now, if you know Virginia, Culpeper to Norfolk is a couple hundred miles. There's no bus. They're walking a couple hundred miles because they believe that the royal government um, is going to uh, result in tyranny. They believe the royal government is going to destroy their rights. And these people are willing to pick up, these farmers are willing to pick up their guns, march several hundred miles to Norfolk, Virginia, and um, they, were, they were part of the military establishment that was created after Patrick Henry's March 23rd speech. Mm -hmm. And they actually, um, when the uh, forces of Lord Dunmore come charging across Great Bridge, it was a bridge across sort of a creek in a swampy area down toward Norfolk, um, the Culpeper Minutemen really decimate them pretty badly, uh, shoot them up pretty badly and um, uh, you know, that's sort of the first significant bloodshed in Virginia. Interesting uh, point of fact, among the Culpeper Minutemen, although he wasn't there at the Battle of Great Bridge, John Marshall, future Supreme Court Justice, mm -hmm. is a member of the Culpeper Minutemen. One of these people who, again, this is extraordinary. They're willing to pick up their guns and march several hundred miles 
because they believe that's what's necessary to protect their liberties. So this may be a nitpicky thing. So why is Patrick Henry associated with that Culpeper Minutemen flag? Was it they was Culpeper like a, a militia unit versus right. just the little town of Culpeper? Right. No, they, they call Pepper Minutemen. It's a militia unit, and they have the famous flag that that has the rattlesnake, "Give me liberty or give me death." Well, right. you know, it's actually a very interesting thing that Henry's speech, uh, when he says "Give me liberty or give me death," that language is actually taken from a famous play. Uh, the play was called Cato. It was George Washington's favorite play. But you know, a question comes up: um, Is it Patrick Henry's speech? that really rallies people. One of the things about the Culpeper Minutemen, and you may have been alluding to this, is they were wearing hunting shirts. They didn't have uniform. We don't have uniforms at this point. We're just starting. Most of them are wearing hunting shirts. And most of those hunting shirts had stitched across the front, liberty or death. And um, this became something that a lot of militiamen were wearing. They would wear these hunting shirts and they'd say liberty or death. Uh, well, when I was putting together that book and, and that uh, online video course about Patrick Henry, well, can you prove that it's Patrick Henry who they were quoting? Well, I found some interesting material actually from the president of Yale uh, up in New Haven, Connecticut. And he talks about shortly after the March 23rd speech that a, um, a sea captain had just come from Virginia and he was talking to him. And the sea captain said, yes, every member of the Virginia Convention is now wearing liberty or death after Patrick Henry's speech. So, mm. you know, it has this enormous impact. And yes, the Culpeper Minutemen are wearing liberty or death, but, but so are many other people that it really becomes a rallying cry. And, and this is why, you know, I said Henry is, is so important. He, uh, Henry doesn't always get the credit he deserves. And um, he sometimes characterizes only giving great speeches. It's really not fair. He becomes the first governor of Virginia. He's intimately involved in the war effort. He's intimately involved in the ratification of the Constitution. But it is true that Patrick Henry is able to um, really rally people to the cause and make them feel it's inevitable. We have to fight. We can win. I mean, Britain's the superpower of the 18th century, but Patrick Henry convinces them we can win. Uh, and, and then, like I said, he's willing to go himself and he's willing to leave. And he does uh, take on a military role for a very short period of time. As you're, as you're aware, he's appointed the head of the Virginia uh, military establishment. He basically resigns that after four or five months. And George Washington, again, is, is says, we really need Patrick Henry in government. We don't need him on the field, um, which is probably just as well. Yeah, no reflection on your military capabilities, sir. <laughs> well, that's Patrick Henry gets criticized um, because of, uh, you know, it's said that he didn't have military experience. I, that's complicated. Yeah. I do think Washington is correct that we were probably better off having Patrick Henry serving in the legislature, serving as governor, um, whatever role he might have had in the military. He never really is given an opportunity because uh, Edmund Pendleton, uh, who at that point is head of the uh, Virginia executive, basically. We don't have a governor. But Pendleton doesn't really trust Patrick Henry, and he doesn't like the idea of Patrick Henry being in charge of the military. And so um, Patrick Henry says, look, I'm not going to argue about this. I'll just go back into the legislature. Interesting. Right. So I, I believe I picked up on that in your in your course, but also... Pendleton in our reenactment, I believe is sort of his, uh, what do you call it? His opposition. He's his a naysayer. Right. Uh, well, sir, it's a good point. I mean, we, we, you know, we remember Patrick Henry's speech and he gave this great speech, but it's a speech to a legislative body. It's the Virginia convention. Um, they were not all convinced. Mm -mm. And, and there's this argument going on and, and the what we would think of as the conservatives, the traditionalists, sort of the old school, Edmund Pendleton, Nicholas, uh, many others are saying, look, um, they don't know about Lexington and Concord, hasn't happened yet. They said, we need to act with moderation. We need to act with care. We need to talk with the governor. We shouldn't do anything precipitous. And so when Patrick Henry go, stands up to give this speech, 
and the speech is saying that the point of the speech was we need to arm we virginia need to arm and he gives this remarkable speech and it's not just the legislatures are there the building is crowded people have come to listen there are people at the windows the, the place is packed and patrick henry give me liberty or give me death stone silence i mean apparently everyone is stunned and there's silence um just for a moment and then richard henry lee jumps up and and seconds patrick henry's motion and there's there's a debate and patrick henry wins they decide that yes we do need to arm um but you know it's it's a close thing um and and pendleton who becomes a great patriot uh, as does Nicholas, as do these others, uh, they were being cautious. Mm -hmm. uh, but they were being cautious the way we sort of would like political leaders to be cautious. You don't go to war with the 18th century superpower just without thinking about it. That's right. And, 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 you know, so um, they, they were saying, you know, slow down, slow down, slow down. But, but Henry really leads people to say, no, it's time. It's time. And again, when, you know, when he's, he's talking about that, the next gale that comes from the north the, will bring us the sound. Of, where's the actual language? The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. He was right. Um, of course, they didn't know that at the time. But, you know, it's, it's going to be weeks later where they're going to hear of Lexington and Concord. Very good. Well, thank you so much. I, um, we could, I could talk to you and listen to you all day. Um, and I have for the past several nights. So that was, again, a great course. Um, maybe we can chat again um, on um, another favorite topic would be the Constitution. Um, happy to talk about it. My current work is on Patrick Henry yeah. and the Constitution. So happy yeah. to talk about that anytime. Great. Well, I really appreciate it. And I'm sure that our, um, our viewers and listeners have enjoyed this as well. So I just want to thank you uh, again. And I will post uh, links to the book and the video, um, the course, I should say, and to our website, uh, St. John's Church Foundation, otherwise known as Historic stjohnschurch.org and we will um see you next time thank you thank so much you. thank you so much sarah all right bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.